Today's guest is in South Carolina, and the last time we spoke was in April of this year, so that's about four and a half months ago. And she contacted me for a one-on-one consultation for sacroiliac pain, so she had early stages of ankylosing spondylitis. So we jumped on a Skype call, just as we are today, but the vibe was very different. She was in a lot of pain and really, really confused between the suggestions from her rheumatologist and also what she knew intuitively, which that something must be causing this and there must be a way that she can influence the uh, pain and inflammation that she was experiencing naturally. So we put a plan together and I'm pleased to say that today she has a tremendous story to share after just four and a half months of making these changes. So Tamara, thank you for coming on and telling your story today. Thank you very much for having me. I'm very happy to be here to share my story. Yes, and um, you're looking so well. And as I just said, um, uh, you know, before we hit record here, uh, it's not that you weren't looking well before. It's just that you're really glowing now, and you have a big smile, much more than we did um, when we did our our you know first conversation. Yeah, I'm much happier now, <laughs> pain free and happier. It's, it's, it really is wonderful. So why don't you uh, just set the scene for this conversation with a little like movie trailer of what we're going to expect. Tell us just in a sentence or two how it was before compared to how you are now. Okay, so, uh, so I was diagnosed with uh, that early stages of axial spondyloarthritis uh, in September of last year. Uh, I was eight months in pain. Um, I had good days, but, uh, most of the days and nights were very painful. Um, and then, uh, eight months after I came across Pattison program and, um, everything started getting better. So, um, I was, my nights were very, very, almost every night was, um, painful. Um, but right now it's like. I have no pain at all during the night, nothing, nothing, nothing at all. Um, also my mornings, um, the first time, the, when I get up from the bed was very, um, I had aches and pains and it was hard to, you know, put a socks on and everything. Um, but that's gone as well. (laughs) So I'm very happy for that. And also I'm able to exercise now, um, much more than I, than I used to do. Um, so Overall, I think I made a lot of a lot of improvement improvements. Yeah, it's uh, always you know, as Doctor McDougall says, when he hears good results from people who follow his recommendations, it just never gets old. Like it's just such it's like beautiful music when you hear someone who's feeling yes. better, you know. <laughs> and like this is your life. This isn't just some some stupid TV commercial promoting some stupid product. This is like eating good food, exercising having a, a an outlook of optimism sharing with each other how you know each other improves and uh, and just really implementing it and doing it and trusting the process so you know exactly. it always well, I always get fired up and excited when uh, when I see someone like yourself uh, just doing so well so let's go into the details here um, I I recall from our first conversation um, that you were being presented with the option of Humira as one of the drugs. Um, what were your thoughts around the Humira? Did you want to, um, you know, uh, was that one of the main motivating factors to look at alternatives or were you already looking for alternatives? So I was, I would say I was already looking for alternatives because I'm not, um, at this stage of my life, I mean, I was diagnosed when I, when I was 31, I'm 32 now. So I was kind of too young to take medications for the rest of my life. And I, that did not fit to my, to my lifestyle. Um, and when doctors told me that the taking medications are not going to, may not solve the problem and may not feel, you know, um, heal me. Uh, that was like a big question mark there for me. Mm. So I was not why to take it, you know, why to, you know, to have that many side effects and everything from the medications, but I can do, maybe I can do something different. Um, 
So then I was just, um, you know, thanks to the uh, Google and World Wide Web, I came across your program and I was reading and listening to other people, you know, and, and the, to the success stories. And uh, something clicked. I was like, this is for me. This works for me right now. Um, and then, um, yeah, so the taking medications were not an option for me. Mm. Maybe like, that was the last option. Let's say, yes, like, that was the a last option. A yeah. last option. And yeah. if I just, um, if I can, uh, you know, recall my, uh, using just off the top of my head, the, the steps that we went through, we, we applied some logic to your situation. And what we discussed was that you were getting what appeared to be autoimmune pain. Your scans, uh, and when I say that, it was tenderness it was a, you know, bad uh, when you stopped moving. Uh, you also had scans done that showed inflammation via an MRI. So you, we, we, we knew that there was active inflammation in an area that was, um, you know, very telling or very indicative of ankylosing spondylitis. The two rheumatologists that you saw both said that it was early stages of, of this condition. And so... You were also concerned with exercise. You weren't sure if it was going to make it feel better or you weren't sure if it was going to make you feel worse. And, and then we, we did a leap of faith, didn't we? We said, well, okay, I've worked with some people with ankylosing spondylitis very closely, some long-term coaching uh, projects, uh, some of which have never appeared on the podcast because of personal reasons. They just want to remain private and that's fine. But I, I drew upon those experiences and said, look, what works so well is just relentless exercise, especially with ankylosing spondylitis, okay? So this is what I'd seen transform people. In, in a, and unfortunately, some, you know, uh, private people and, uh, and I can't get to just show the dramatic changes. But um, I, I, I said, you've got to exercise, basically. Um, and then secondly, we said, well, if it's autoimmune, then you then let's take a couple of days without eating and pretty quick you'll know if the pain goes away then it's coming from all this microbiome um you know oxidative stress um you know the, the whole sort of gamut of of autoimmune um paradigm right so you did that and you emailed me a couple of days later and what did you find when you stopped eating for a couple of days Oh, I felt amazing. I felt amazing. Um, I mean, otherwise than being hungry, uh, I was, uh, I felt that my, that not eating was helping my, you know, my pain go away. Um, so, and actually I didn't have pain those, um, two days. Um, and I, I think that was the right way to start the healing process with me. And I think that um, program was very I found it very personal because everything that I read in the in your book and uh, everything you wrote there um, I really agree with everything with exercise you know changing the food um, sleeping and uh, you know all the mindset and everything I really really agree with that so um, actually the beginning of the program was very hard not easy like you know nothing is easy not not every, um, everything is, you know, you have to push through some things, you know, but um, it really helped me. It really helped me. Like the, be be the beginning was the key to, you know, to, um, to believe and to have a, um, you know, faith for the, for the future. <laughs> yeah. And I think that, you know, what we just had established then is some clarity and that's what we were after. Because there was such yep. uncertainty when we first spoke as to whether or not you should, um, you know, do which path you should take, and just finding some certainty because of um, um, the the uh, as you said your age, um, the diagnosis, um, the early stages, which makes you feel, gosh, it's a strong drug for very early stages, um, and all of this uncertainty. So what we had then established is that it's very likely to be autoimmune as your diagnosis was because we had found, okay, the pain goes away when you don't eat and you do a two-day cleanse with celery, cucumber, and lots of different leafy greens. And then 
you you we you then emailed me and and we uh, on email and we said okay well we've got clarity go for it just do the program because it's basically designed for autoimmune inflammation so you you're all set you know you're not a special case just roll this out okay now you rolled it out you haven't needed the medication you've explained earlier how much better you feel and you're functioning tell us what you did i mean most of our audience know or have the Patterson program, they know what's involved. What aspects of it did you emphasize and what what worked really well? What was your what was your sort of special source? Okay, so um first of all, when I started a program, it was um middle of COVID pandemic and it was lockdown. So I was home 24-7. So I had all my time to dedicate to my food and health and exercise, you know, and everything about the program. So I was very lucky to, you know, um, to have all the time just, just for Pattison program. Um, and, um, yeah, I think, I mean, the most, there is no just one thing that worked for me. I think the combination of everything. So the like really, really, really good and, you know, healthy food, um, good exercise, Bikram yoga. Um, I also started doing, not right away at the beginning, but maybe after a month or two months, I started cold showers and cold ice cold baths, which also I think um, helped. Um, yeah, and just, you know, staying um, overall, staying healthy and, you know, and, and not reducing the stress and, and all the other stuff. So it's a kind of, one one nice package of, of of the healthy things that I was doing, which which all helped me. Yeah, um, I want to ask you about how you did the Bikram at home and what you know videos you followed and if you used heat and stuff. But before I get to those specifics, here's a question that I haven't asked for a long time. Um, what does healing feel like to someone who hasn't experienced it? Um. Hmm, tough question. Yes. So I would say I was the the at, from the beginning I felt that um systemic healing like you explained in one of your podcasts. So I I felt like that my whole body is feeling better, not just my um um SI joint and and pain around. I was I felt my whole body is feeling better and I had more energy every day. Um, and I was just being more, you know, I, I was smiling more every day <laughs> because of that. So, um, yeah, just that. I mean, it's very hard to explain. It's very hard to explain how, how this healing feel, but um, it feels good. It feels very good. And you know that you're doing the right thing. Uh, and I, I knew and I know right now that I'm doing the right thing. So uh, because the, the response I get from my body is, I mean, nobody can give me that, you know. So my body is telling me everything. Mm. It's very subtle, isn't it? It's not yeah. like when you take a painkiller and then within a couple of hours you say, oh, yeah, I can feel, you know, uh, quite a quick change to my state. Um, it, 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 and, and, and with something like a painkiller, if the fingers are swollen, for example, with rheumatoid, you know, they're still swollen. You just don't mm. feel them as much. Uh, right. But with a healing process, you, you you actually, just as you described, it's it's more of just a, a, a gradual alleviation of all of the body's concerns, pains, inflammations, and stresses over a very, very stretched out period of time. So you don't suddenly feel anything different it happens over in my case like months and years um but um and in your case weeks and months but it, it, it's slow and it and it just sort of it's more of a, a, a like a sun rising as opposed to turning on the light yeah correct i agree with you mm. um and so now let's talk about the bikram you know a lot of people are uh, faced with a similar situation with COVID and thinking about trying to do a yoga class at home. 
did you turn up the heat or did you, you know, steam the bathroom up or did you just do it, follow a video online in your li- living room? So for, I did not do Bikram at home because when I started the program, everything was, the yoga studios were still closed because of the COVID. So I, even if I wanted to, I couldn't go to, to do Bikram outside. So I was doing some light yoga. That was uh, only the first month. I think, yeah. So I was doing some light, like beginner's yoga classes at home. Uh, and then after that, like after a, about a month, I started going to the Bikram yoga studio um, for like about three or four times a week, um, which like it was amazing. I mean, I, I tried Bikram a few years ago, so I knew exactly what to expect. Uh, but right now in this this um my condition and everything um it felt really good actually i was a little afraid to do some things you know in the class some poses and everything but every every class got better and better and right now i'm i'm the best in the class (laughs) (laughs) isn't that brilliant yes i um i just want to yeah i want to say this first of all that my recommendations for you again, were based on the collective wisdom and feedback and anecdotal stories that I've had from others with ankylosing spondylitis success stories. And I recommended to you that swimming and Mm -hmm. Bikram yoga are your two most powerful positive um, uh, impact exercises for the area that you are inflamed. and it's just so encouraging and reassuring and reaffirming to me to hear that you did one of those two and you got the same outcome as others who have the same condition and have done that as well. So there's nothing like, there's no luck involved. It's, it's doing it. Um, so I, I'm, uh, you weren't able to swim, were you? That wasn't an option. I was, um, hmm. I was, I went for swimming just a few times, mm-hmm. you know, so, but I kind of picked Bikram over yeah. swimming yeah. and, uh, I also started doing uh, some training and like gym training with yep. mostly body weight exercises and, uh, some machines, nothing too crazy, nothing too heavy. Um, and that combination of Bikram and gym training, um, and eventually started running a little bit, I think that works for me right now. Um, so I kind of, I kind of picked that over swimming. Yeah. My, you know, my, my magic combo for a decade was Bikram yoga and the gym. I mean, that's, that's, that's like vanilla flavored, how to get well. Uh, so yeah. yeah, so that's awesome. Tell us then you were a little concerned about these exercises at the Bikram. Uh, can you, can we just take a, a, sh- a short step back and say, what what is the early stages of ankylosing spondylitis? W- try and describe the point in which it affects the, the body, the part in which it affects the body, and, um, and therefore, um, which postures in class were, were concerning for you? All right. Um, so... I used to have pain in my, of course, in my SI joint, but it's not always there. So sometimes it's my hips. Um, so sometimes I have left hip and then after two weeks, it's right hip and then it's hip flexors and then it's again back to SI. So it's kind of, it was moving around. It was moving around. Um, so with Bikram, the to be honest, the hardest pose for me was just lying down on my back, savasana, because then you're flat on the back and the toes, so you turn your toes out. And my, I guess the, there is some sort like very minor movements in the SI when you do that pose. Mm. So that was like, um, I was in pain when I was in doing that pose, you know, just lying down. Um, but again, after after a few weeks, I was I was able to do it. But every other pose was 
you know, when I do it slowly in with, with a lot of control and focusing on the right muscle group and everything, um, everything was good. You know, just I'm always, even right now, uh, I'm always careful and I'm always doing everything slowly, everything with a lot of, um, with a lot of focus. Yes. Mindfulness, awareness. Yes. yes. Yeah. Good. Good. I think, you know, that's a good reminder to all of us. I, I'm exactly the same. I haven't done a class since the whole uh, COVID thing kicked in. Um, they are open again, but uh, I'm just finding that I'm enjoying going to the gym at the moment and I get on a stationary bike each day for my cardio. Um, but totally when I'm in the class, um, you know, I'm I'm always thinking about, you know, my own imperfections in my body and being mindful very, very much so about those areas and things that I make slight modifications for, uh, you know, in certain postures, just as you've described. We've got to be careful. When our body's compromised, we have to be super careful. Yeah. I've just bringing up I've just brought up the email that you uh, uh, sent me before we did this call. Um, and you've actually uh, mentioned here something that we haven't talked about. You do a, a, a water fast. You've been doing a water fast and with green juice just once a month? Mm -hmm. 36 hours once a month. Um, I would like to do it more often, maybe every two weeks. But right now I'm doing just once a month. Yes. And um, is that preventative or do you still have a, a, like, do you still notice that you get like shave another one or 2% off any underlying situation? I think it's more preventative and I think, um, um, it's good for overall health, you know, and for the immune system. So why not? Yeah, absolutely. And, uh, yeah. So I'm doing every other little aspects, which can be helpful for my overall health. Um, and, um, I feel good. I feel good when I do it. I mean, not not that I'm enjoying not eating, yeah. but but overall after that, I feel good and my body feels you know good and clean, very clean. Um, so th th that's why I um, that's why I'm doing it. You also um, have mentioned here something that I'm observing when I talk to you. You uh, you appear to be a similar weight or the same weight as when we spoke, you know, four five months ago. And one concern that some people have who just do the eating component and don't work out, who don't use their muscles, don't do resistance training or Bikram, which has a, a, you know, a component to it where you've got to build muscle and build strength. Um, so my question is, um, how were you able to maintain your weight? Or if you lost a little weight at the start as the body's making these adjustments and healing and detoxing and so forth, how did you then put the weight back on or was it something that just e evolved because you do a lot of physical resistance work? So, yes. So at the beginning, I lost about um, about 13 pounds, uh, but I knew when once I started eating more and exercising more that I'm going to gain that back. I mean, I know my body. Um, so um, and that happened. So just. Just eating more, eating better foods, doing resistant training. Um, it helped me to get back to my normal weight, which I'm very happy with. Um, so, um, yeah, it wasn't, it wasn't, uh, too hard for me. It wasn't too hard for me. Mm -hmm. I'm just now, even when I, when I eat better and when I, um, when I'm finally able to exercise regularly, I feel that, um, um, that my body kind of changed in a better way that, you know, that I'm stronger and then I feel better and I, I can move better. Um, so, you know, good food gives, gives me energy to do a good exercise. And um, that's how it is every day. Yeah. <clears throat> the good food gives you the energy to do the exercise is so true. And yeah. for, if anyone's listening and they're concerned about being underweight, the first thing you have to do is start challenging your muscles. That's the first thing because fat can spontaneously appear on the body by eating poorly, by eating high fat foods, junk foods, but muscle does not spontaneously appear. It has to grow as a result of being challenged. And so we need to start with challenging the muscles 
And then what follows is more hunger and more appetite leading to higher calorie intake to fuel the to fuel the muscles and the body begins that positive cycle. So um you know Definitely. yeah so that's where it starts. It starts with asking yeah. more of the body. Yes, I would just like to add that um right now when when I learned a lot about nutrition and um about my body, I just I don't eat just because I'm hungry or but just because I have to eat. Uh, I eat to feed my body and to feed my cells and to feed, to, to get that energy from the food. Um, and I also am very focused on the, I mean, I'm not perfect. I don't eat everything 100% perfectly, but I'm like most of the time I'm focused on the, on the quality of food that I eat. And there is a reason why we put that food in our body. Because that food is doing something for us, healing us or giving us energy and feeding our body. So, um, yeah, that's 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 just the one thing that I realized that I wanted to share share with you. Yeah, that's a really nice point. We get in the habit of just eating because we're hungry for no other reason. We're mm-hmm. hungry, so we eat. And you've made such a good point is that we should be hungry because we've asked the question of our body, hey, can you do this? Can you do that for me? I need you to lift that. I need you to push that. I need you to take me up to the top of the hill, whatever it might be. And then the body says, okay, I've done that for you. Now I need some, you know, replenishing. And so you should replenish it and reward it. And your point, you know, is that we shouldn't just be hungry from doing nothing and feed junk into us and then just be hungry again. It's pointless, isn't it? (laughs) Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> yeah, no, no way. I, I like that. I'm going to be thinking about that today. Okay, so look, sometimes we get some audience members who are still sitting on the fence and they say to me, they email and say, yeah, but um, X, Y, or yeah, but this. And, you know, and I like to try and break down the yeah, buts in our interviews now so that there's not much left to sort of challenge. Someone's going to say, yeah, but you haven't had your MRI done or yeah, but you've not had a blood test since you made these changes. Um, Tell us, uh, what do you expect when you go and have those scans and tests done? What do you, what do you expect is going to show up or not show up? Um, I'm not actually thinking about it right now. Uh, I just know that I'm feeling better and that's kind of enough for me right now. And I will try to continue doing things um, the best that I can. Uh, and then we'll see what's, what all the scans and everything will show. I think, I mean, I would love to see some very, that I'm healed a hundred percent and everything, but that's then might not get that yet happen because of the, you know, this is, uh, kind of lifetime disease what that's how they call it uh so um yeah i will see i'm not too stressed about it i don't want to think too much that i must get better i must see um you know certain numbers or certain scan results i don't want to just just be too obsessed about it i want to enjoy the process as much as i can you know that that's a really really important point the last comment you made, I have something like 60 blood tests, uh, scanned blood reports that I have from the period where I was on methotrexate for three and a half, four years, and then blood tests prior to that. So 60 might be, I mean, let's say once a month for four years, so that's four twelves of 48 so that's and a couple of, I might have between say 40 and 50 blood tests over three and a half, four year period. So thereabouts, but then I have like three ever since. Okay. So in like the 10 years since that, my blood has been really measured for C-reactive protein, except in circumstances where it has had to be. And where I'm, my, my point here is, um, You know, when we're feeling well, we're not in the cycle of being tested and being judged on that and being manipulated or having our drugs changed on that. And it's a completely different paradigm uh, to when we are in the medical 
sort of manipulation period. And so what is always challenging with these sort of scenarios outside of a clinical trial setting is that, you know, you want to maintain the positive feeling, outlook, mental attitude and momentum that you have, you know, in your mind as well as in your body. So you don't want to go into another lab and be jabbed and be and and have any kind of feeling that you currently have influenced by a slightly less than ideal result. You just want to continue to improve. Yes. And having a number messes with your mind or having a discussion with someone who disagrees with what you're doing, it messes with your mind. And so I understand this feeling of, look, just keep crushing it, just keep feeling better. And when the day comes when you feel emotionally calm and stable, you can get the blood test done, you can get the MRI done because you're in a position where you're not going to be influenced by the outcome. You'll be neutral and you'll be like, okay, I can handle that. Because whilst we're still a little vulnerable, still a little green, still a little wet behind the ears, um, we don't want to be, uh, you know, negatively influenced by a number. Um, If you were worsening, if you were feeling bad, a number would be really helpful to see if a decision needs to be made with meds. But if you're crushing it, you're in no pain. I mean, come on, do we really need to go and, you know, play with the lab rat when the rat feels like jumping around the cage? I'm sorry about that silly metaphor. (laughs) 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 I mean, it it applies to all of us. I'm not just, you know, making that silly comment about your specific case. (laughs) So, yeah, wonderful. Well, uh, um, you know, it's been uh, just the cold showers. How do you do the cold showers here? Um, so I was also researching about that, like, um, if that can help with my condition or, or, um, with any, um, autoimmune disease. And I found, I found some research that it could help, you know? Uh, so, um, I just started little by little. I mean, that was the one thing that I said, never, I'm never going to do that. I don't, I hate cold showers, um, But when I, you know, you just have to educate yourself and to see why are you doing that? Not just because you read somewhere and somebody told you. Um, So I tried to, you know, um, to educate myself, to see, to see why is that good for me and for my body. And then little by little, I started doing like um, a hot shower and after that, like lukewarm and then colder and colder. And now most days of the week, I do uh, cold showers, and it actually feels very good. Um, it doesn't feel that cold <laughs> like at the beginning. Um, and then approximately like once a week, uh, I do like a cold bath, like ice cold oh, uh, bath. Wow. I just sit there for like um, um, for seven minutes, eight minutes. Depends. I'm not too obsessed with a, with a, you know, with a number, with a, you know, I have to do 10 minutes or I don't want to, uh, to, um, to put too much on my plate. Um, so if I feel good doing more that day, I will do more minutes. If not, I will do shorter. So whatever works for me in that moment. Yeah. So, uh, and actually it feels good. It feels good. You keep, you feel kind of, I don't know, like, it feels refreshing, very refreshing mm. for the whole body. Mm. I've never done that, and I'm super impressed because I've watched sporting stars. There's a basketballer called Ben Simmons who's from Australia, and he uh, plays for the uh, uh, one of the basketball NBA teams. And I watched an interview him. I watched an interview with him, and he was sitting in an ice bath during the interview. And I remember thinking, gosh, that, that, that's just got to be – I watched him get into it and I thought, how would I ever do that? And so when I – you know, you've just described doing the same thing. So that's that's got to be on my bucket list to be able to get into an ice bath. Um, I'm Why so not? impressed. <laughs> Why not? Yeah, absolutely. Well, thank you. This has been totally enjoyable to sit here and, and, and hear about all the things that you've been doing to improve your health. Um, you're obviously gone against the grain and gone against the typical path that someone with your diagnosis would now be on. And I think you've wisely pointed out that 
Um, that doesn't mean that there isn't, you know, it's not like rainbows and fairies for the rest of your life. It's hard work, discipline, and a constant checking in on how things are uh, periodically. But we have to celebrate every small victory um, when we have an autoimmune disease. Uh, I used to celebrate just being able to walk an extra 10 metres past a stop sign and back each day. That used to be like, that used to make my day. I walked an extra 10 steps, you know what I mean? So yep. compared to walking an extra 10 steps, when you've eliminated the pain that was agonising you for eight months and, you know, uh, gone on a path that's uplifting you and making you smile every day and making you feel better as well as getting rid of the pain, there's, there's cause for massive celebration. So hopefully this has lifted everyone's spirits and uh, helped them also to, to see that, you know, constantly applying these positive changes can yield extremely positive results. Yeah, I, I totally agree with you. I totally agree with you. Um, I felt the same way with um, walking and also with, with running. So I started running a little bit and uh, I was not, not able to run before that. I mean, even right now I'm very careful and I'm, you know, listening to my body, but even just running just, you know, for five minutes is a big accomplishment and we should be thankful for that. Yeah. Um, we sometimes take our health for granted and we are like, ah, it's okay, you know, but sometimes it's, a, you know, ju just doing a little things is, um, is a big thing, actually. So I totally agree with everything you said. Yes. Running creates euphoria. Yeah, running is just like an elixir for the body. It's just such a beautiful experience. And the studies show, uh, not that you have any osteoarthritis in your knees, but studies have showed that people with existing osteoarthritis in their knees, um, by running regularly, it does not aggravate or worsen the osteoarthritis in the knees. People are concerned about running as being potentially harmful for arthritic joints. Unless anyone specifically experiences the pain the next day and aggravation from running, then run, 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 because it is euphoric. It makes us feel alive. It, it is exactly like you say, it's so up, like makes you feel like you're achieving something that previously you couldn't. So look, um, I'm just so chuffed and happy that you're able to do that and uh, continue to push, 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 become a like, become as athletic as you can, like make athleticism and, and, and health just an obsession. And um, that will be the greatest way of preventing the, uh, the issues from, from showing up again in the future. Yes, thank you. Thank you very much for that. I'm very, very, very grateful to uh, for Patterson program because um, it's it's a it's a totally kind of new and healthier way to treat a disease, um, and uh, it's it's sustainable. So it's um, it just feels great. It feels great, and I'm very happy that I'm able to exercise and to run and to uh, sit right now without a pain and everything. So um, yeah, mm. thank you for. That. Mm. Well, thanks for sharing your story, Tamara. It's been wonderful to see you again and looking so great and having such a, a great story to, to share after such a short period of time. Well done. I'm going to let you go and have your dinner because I think it's about dinner time for you. Yes, um, it is. Yes, yeah. it is. So go and enjoy your nice, nutritious, plant-based meal. And uh, I look forward to um, maybe chatting with you another time down the track if we check in down the future. Yes, thank you very much. Thank you.